uh, the uprising. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Oh, there's Kara. Fantastic. Hi. Welcome, Kara. Thank you. Nice Kara. to see. Now, if you if you if you say that you're from East Aurora as well, this is just going to be too scary. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> is hey, everyone else here from East Aurora? I'm not, and okay. Kevin's not, but the remainder are. So. Okay. No, I got to clarify. I'm not. I'm not from East Aurora. I just Jeff's the East Aurora guy. I'm. I'm North oh. Buffalo, which is also oh, okay. uh, gotcha. at its fair share of bad news lately, so. <clears throat> oh, that's strange. What's that? Sorry about that. I realized YouTube runs a little slower, so we had a double link going on there. Um, okay, so I, I think we're probably ready to get started. Um, if you're ready to go, let me just ask before we do, uh, do any of you need to share the screen for the purpose of, of um, uh, any kind of presentation slides? No. Not necessary, but just curious from the standpoint of, of setting it up. I mean, I, I, have, a, I have a table I, I could show, but okay. I didn't, um, in, my, in my notes, I didn't really, um, I didn't really have time to prepare like nice. That's uh, fine. Nice not, not necessary. But if you if you do want to, you have the share screen option available to you. So uh, um, feel free to jump into that. Uh, and I think you have full control of that. Uh, but let me know if you don't and I can help um, pass over that. So welcome uh, and welcome to our uh, attendees as well to the, the fifth year of our social justice speaker series here at Niagara University. I'm Dave Riley. I'm the chair of political science. Uh, I'm also a faculty advisor to the Justice House's living and learning communities, uh, along with my colleagues and professors, Kevin Hinckley and, and Leslie Pickering, uh, who are also here on the panel. About four years ago, uh, we started partnering with Burning Books to begin offering a social justice speaker series to our uh, students, our campus, and the broader community. Uh, the series has been a great success by just about any measure. Uh, the turnout and the interest in the topics has steadily grown and awareness about social issues has increased as well. Um, so this has been a really a true collaboration with Burning Books and I'm very appreciative um, of, of this partnership and of Leslie's help in, in bringing this forward. Um, so our series has been a compilation of activists, educators, resistors across a spectrum of political and social issues. We've met environmentalists, anti-war activists, investigative journalists, anti-racists, feminists, whistleblowers, legal and ethical advocates, animal rights defenders, political prisoners, uh, and individuals who have fought for liber liberation across a spectrum of struggles. The purpose of our series has been and will continue to be to engage the campus and the broader community in these struggles by introducing the ideas of individuals who have been active participants and who have led them. We believe we've been able to contribute to important dialogue on and off campus and to motivate our students and our community to work for social justice. Uh, today's panel is Our ICE Detention Facilities Modern Day Concentration Camps, a provocative title, but I think it's deserving and one uh, where that, that question has been raised in the mainstream media uh, and really deserves, I think, greater scrutiny. Uh, and, and our panel is in a, in a great position to do that. Um, we have three experts who have researched and investigated and worked to um, support the, the migrants who have been detained by DHS and ICE detention facilities. Um, and, and these individuals have fought to protect migrants and their families from inhumane treatment in, in different ways. So Phil Gambini is an author for the Investigative Post, the only news organization in Western New York dedicated exclusively to watchdog journalism. They produce fact-based nonpartisan investigative stories and analyses on issues that matter to the citizens and taxpayers of Buffalo and Western New York. And Phil has investigated a variety of topics and issues, including police misconduct, detention facility practices, financial mis mismanagement by off-track betting, and, and many others. Kara Stratton is the housing post-release and court support coordinator for Justice for Migrant Families, 
In her role, Kara trains and manages volunteers and scheduling in addition to communicating with other advocacy organizations across the country. She's also the Justice for Migrant Families Liaison to Freedom for Immigrants. And Rob Galbraith is a researcher and writes for Little Sis, a grassroots watchdog or network that connects the dots between the world's most powerful people and organizations. He has written on fracking in the energy industry, the climate crisis, and detention facility profiteers, among other subjects. So thank you to all three of you for being a part of the discussion today. Um, for our attendees, what I will ask is that you, um, uh, if you have any questions, that you enter them into the Q&A section of, uh, of the, the panel, uh, and we will uh, queue those up for discussion toward the end. Uh, but what we will do is we will actually elevate you to panel status so that you can ask your questions um, and we can see your face as you're, as you're talking. So, um, bear with us. We're working through the technology, which is not ideal for this kind of, of interaction, but it's the best that we can do under the circumstances. Um, so if we could, I'd like to ask Kara to begin and, and start off with your work with Justice for Migrant Families. Sure, thank you so much for, for having me and this amazing panel. Um, I'm really happy to be here. So I uh, um, am the post-release housing coordinator and court support coordinator. Um, among other things, we are an almost entirely volunteer run, very small organization. So each of us wear many hats. So I feel like my titles change all of the time. Um, I'll t talk a bit more about what those titles actually mean later on. Um, but just to how, how I got involved in this work, uh, Justice for Migrant Families began um, in October of 2016, there were really large workplace raids in Buffalo and over 40 people were impacted by immigration enforcement. So groups of community organizers and faith groups and just concerned people came together to try to figure out how to support the people whose partners had been detained, whose children had been taken away, whose employment had been taken away. Um, through direct actions, fundraisers, and other kinds of support. So um, while I have been involved in various kinds of activism my life, in my life, um, I have always tried to figure out how what I could do for a living uh, could coincide with my deeply held values. So I worked in various small arts nonprofits here and in California and in agriculture um, and various things. I have a master's in literature. So the winding paths by which we get to where we are. But in December of 2016, I asked my friend Jennifer, who is now the executive director of Justice for Migrant Families, way, how I could support. And so we began co-teaching um, English as a second language classes at a local church for the people who were impacted by those work raids who became known as the Buffalo 25. Um, from there, a group of us realized that there were some real gaps in resources available to immigrants, but particularly those immigrants impacted by immigration enforcement, um, whether those people were in detention center or going through proceedings in courts. So together we created this organization to try to address um, those needs and to provide resources for people. Um, so that brings me to some local context for immigration. Um, I know Phil and Rob are gonna probably address this in much more detail, uh, but the Western New York area is unique in that it is where there are immigration courts outside of New York City. Um, there's an ICE headquarters, there's an immigration detention facility, and a border area that has different constitutional rules than areas outside of the border area. So for example, um, 100 miles from the border, uh, Border Patrol, which is part of the Customs and Border Protection, can stop your car with very minimal evidence. 20 miles from the border, federal regulations allow border patrol to go on private property without a warrant. So much of Western, all of Western New York falls within that area, I think. Um, there is one immigration court 
inside the Buffalo Federal Detention Facility, which is in Batavia, New York. And there is um, one immigration court inside Buffalo. Everyone in immigration proceedings in New York State who resides north of Hudson, New York, attends court inside Buffalo, um, unless they're detained and then they're in the Batavia court. So that means some people have to travel like up to 300 miles for their court hearing. Um, and there are many people who live outside of the state and then um, return to Buffalo for hearings. So when I say I'm a court support coordinator, people contact us from all over the state and from the country and ask for help with transportation, where they're gonna stay. Um, prior to the pandemic, we would have groups of volunteers who would go in and witness the hearings themselves so that for both for moral support and to kind of track how um, judges ruled um, during the hearings and, and try to track for bias and just to be an observer, an outside observer. So right now we're primarily working with people inside the Buffalo Federal Detention Facility in Batavia. We do work with people who have been released, um, but primarily, particularly since the pandemic, our, our work has been in, inside the detention center. Um, the US has the largest immigrant detention center in the world. On any given day, there's something like 45 to 50,000 people who are detained in immigrant detention um, each day. In New York State, as of 2018, there were about 76 facilities that could hold immigrants in detention. And the majority of them are county jails that um, uh, through contracts with ICE um, hold bed space for immigrants. There are in New York State two um, federal immigrant detention facilities. One is in New York City, the Barrick Process Street, Barrick Street Processing Center, and the other is in Batavia. So the one in Batavia has a capacity for about 650 people. There are eight units, seven for men and one for women. Um, prior to the pandemic, there were, it was around capacity. And right now it is at far less, but one of the things um, that we, along with other national immigrant advocacy groups have been tracking is um, the continued transfer of people around um, different facilities, which has only increased the spread of COVID in immigrant detention facilities. So um, the, the detention center in Batavia started being used for immigrant detention around 2012. It's owned by ICE. It's operated by Akima Global Services, which is a private for-profit federal government contracting company. And it adheres to ICE performance standards from 2011. I think there are three different set of standards that ICE is supposed to adhere to, but these standards are not legally binding or, and they're not enforceable. So it is very, very challenging for advocates to um, make complaints for uh, civil rights abuses to, to get addressed in any real way. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's very hard. Immigrant um, people in immigrant detention are held in civil custody, um, but the standards that ICE uses are based on criminal correctional standards. So just quickly, who is there? There are asylum seekers, people who come to ports of entry and um, claim asylum. There's people who are picked up who have differing immigration status. Often the most high risk activities are um, driving or using public transportation. Um, people with prior criminal convictions or charges. That is actually um, a great number of people who are there right now. And people who try to seek asylum in Canada and then are turned back because there has been an agreement between Canada and the US around that um, and they're put immediately into detention. 
Um, there's also, you know, people we hear a lot right around the Buffalo area of people who are um, just trying to navigate Buffalo and end up on the Peace Bridge or on the Rainbow Bridge. And then suddenly they're being processed and they end up in the detention center. So um, people there are being held for civil charges. Um, and yet they do not have the same constitutional rights as citizens. They do not have guaranteed access to a free attorney. They do not have a right to a free phone call. They do not have a right to a speedy trial. Um, and just quickly a little bit about the daily experience there. This is um, based on a lot of the people we work with talking to us. Um, the units are kind of like open floor dormitories. Most do not have doors on the, on the shared cells. All meals and almost all activities take place within these units. Um, because this is supposed to be a temporary place, uh, this is not supposed to be a place designed for punishment or a place where you are held for a long time, just a place where you are going through immigration proceedings and then you move on. Um, this place is not designed for prolonged detention. There are no activities. There are very few activities. I think there's a crocheting uh, um, and there is a gym that people are allowed in for basketball once in a while. Um, but there's, there's no organized, real organized activities. Um, the boredom is excruciating there. there the library is extraordinarily small and contains mostly books in English. And um, they, there are reports of lockdown in the units from 12 to 18 hours a day. There's very sporadic access to outside time. Um, and the reports we get through our phone line and through visitation is of um, people experiencing medical neglect, uh, physical abuse, insufficient food, um, lack of orientation to the legal process. People do not know when they get in there, for example, what is gonna happen next and if they are going to see a lawyer or how to find that lawyer. Most things that people find out about are through word of mouth. And the detention facility says that they offer people a handbook when they are um, detained but no one um, we have spoken to or the New York Immigration Coalition has spoken to has actually ha seen that handbook. So there's a lot of confusion, um, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of boredom. Um, so what we do, we help people connect to legal, financial and community resources. Um, we used to run a visitation program and every weekend volunteers would go out and meet for one to two hours with a visit. The, the visits are through like thick kind of plate glass windows in these tiny cubicles and over a phone. Um, and the, the process by which you, <laughs> you sign up for visitation is very Baroque, but um, people are extraordinarily isolated when they're held in immigrant detention. And so that kind of human connection and outside connection is vitally important. Um, in addition, it's also vitally important for people in the community to ha start having a personal relationship with people who are going through immigration proceedings. You can see what's happening on the news or you can read books, but to actually see the process yourself is invaluable um, in, in understanding how this, how the immigration system can really tear apart people and communities. So um, since the pandemic, the visitation program has been canceled for all detention facilities in the country. So we have a phone line um, that we had prior to the pandemic, but right now it is our main way of connecting with people. Um, people inside the facility can call us um, to report abuses, report if they're ill, um, try to find legal help. 
um, ask for commissary or pen pals and sometimes just talk. Um, we, the commissary system there in order to make the phone call um, to our phone line, we provide commissary to help people do this and to call their friends and family because everything inside the detention facility costs money. Um, so it costs six to seven cents a minute to call, to make a phone call when you're detained inside New York state. It costs 15 cents a, a minute to call a landline internationally and around 35 cents to call a cell phone internationally. That's an extraordinary amount of money for people who um, may be coming here to seek asylum for people coming from lots of different circumstances and who may not have strong family and community connections in the United States. Um, to have a video visitation, it's $6 for 30 minutes. So in addition, because of the complaints of the food quality and that there's insufficient food, um, people spend a lot of their commissary money on um, food. So for a package of ramen is $4. And since the pandemic began, and I think Phil and Rob may go into this more, um, there is a definite lack of access to hygiene materials. So it's $3 for a bar of soap. Um, so commissary is vitally important. So we try to do all of these things to make connections um, and at the same time organize to change this inhumane system itself, um, the system that leads to detention and deportation. So we worked very hard with a lot of different groups to get the green light legislation passed in New York State this past year. Um, that allows access to driver's licenses for people regardless of their immigration status. Um, again, driving is one of the main ways that people can get picked up and then put into de detention. Um, and then we also organize against the system of detention itself um, because there, it is possible to have community-based alternatives <laughs> to to detention, um, there is no reason that people who are coming here are, or people who've overstayed their student visas or whatever their circumstance, people who commit um, a misdemeanor as defined <laughs> by this set of laws um, have to be, be locked up um, in order to go through these proceedings. So I will answer more questions later, but. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, Kara. That's a great um, introduction as well to give us a sense of what's going on. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Phil at this point um, to talk about um, uh, some of the research that he has done that I think complements the, um, the, the details that Kara has already started to present to us. So, Phil? Dave, just real quick, lead in with yep. an introduction here about how I got involved in the work and then go Sure. Wonderful. Yep. All right. So, um, my name is Phil Gambini. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Kevin, for inviting me. Thank you, Kara, for your work as well and the work of your organization. Um, I got into investigative journalism because I came back to Buffalo after I went to art school and I needed extra money. I was a landscaper and, a, uh, and I bust tables and I ended up freelancing for the Buffalo News. I got a gig up in Niagara Falls at a paper called the Niagara Gazette. And uh, while, while I was working at the Niagara Gazette, I got exposed to uh, the discussion around the green light law. Um, and I also got exposed to um, discussions and information surrounding the, the, the community of migrant workers um, that support the economy uh, and support the community up in Niagara County um, at dairy farms, at fruit farms. Um, there's, a, there's a columnist up there actually by the name of Jim Schultz. Uh, and Jim did a lot of work in Bolivia, a lot of advocacy work in Bolivia. And he was actually accused of um, of fomenting a coup uh, by the government in, in the newspaper. And the way I met Jim was uh, Jim came to me and he said, you know, Phil, um, I see this discussion around the green light law and I wanna let you know what it's like to live under existential threat in a community, to feel as if by virtue of 
your fundamental existence, you don't belong there. And not only that, you're, you've been declared an enemy for whatever reason. Um, and Jim said, the only place I felt even remotely safe was my office and my house. Travel, as Kara pointed out, was terrifying because you just didn't know what was coming around the corner. And I think it's difficult to fully um, capture what that means. You know, I certainly don't have any firsthand experience with it. Maybe a little bit in terms of, you know, people's uh, detestment for the press nowadays, but nothing that approximates um, being discriminated against uh, for your heritage, your ethnicity, your skin color, your religion, your sexuality, any of that. Um, and it stuck with me. And so when I got to IP, Investigative Post, uh, which is a nonprofit newsroom, um, this was one of the issues that I wanted to get into. I wanted to ask questions uh, about this system. Um, and so that started, the first opportunity I got to do that was during the pandemic because uh, there was a lot of focus on um, carceral settings and what that was going to mean to the spread. And we now know the answer to that question. We knew it then, but we know now from statistics that there's super spreader events. You know, they're just, they, they incubate disease. Um, Social distancing is a non-starter in a detention setting because you're not, <laughs> they're not, the spaces aren't built for distance. They're built to, to house people, to warehouse people like filing cabinets and every inch makes a difference, uh, especially if you're talking about a private contractor because each of those inches uh, adds up to another body in their detention center and that's money. Which brings me, I guess, um, to Akima. Global Services, which is a subsidiary of an Alaskan native corporation uh, based in Alaska. Um, and they have headquarters in Virginia and Anchorage, I believe. Um, but they got a contract down here. It's a 10 year contract. It started in 2014 uh, with the Batavia detention, uh, federal detention facility, which incidentally to Kara's earlier point uh, about how it's designed to be a temporary facility ICE actually refers to it as a processing center. Um, it's not that in use because people spend years there. Uh, I believe earlier this year, uh, a man from Jamaica was, was released after five years in the Batavia detention facility without a bond hearing. He didn't even have the opportunity um, to post collateral. Um, and that's extremely consequential in a situation like this because you're talking about people who are, many of whom are in a country whose systems and bureaucracies they're, they're unfamiliar with. Um, and the idea that you wouldn't be able to build a case, or I should say you would build a case while you're detained without a lawyer, likely without any kind of fluent understanding of, of English, especially when you're talking about like legal documents, it's just, it's basically, it, it, it's basically a death sentence. Um, for your hopes of staying in this country if you're denied bail. Um, at any rate, uh, Akima runs the, the, the facility where you go if you are denied bail. And there's, as Kara mentioned, capacity for 650 people. I think right now there's somewhere between 350 or 400, largely as a result of people being moved around um, during the pandemic, uh, which is extremely difficult to track. Um, and give credit to Kara and uh, others in the organization for undertaking that effort because it's it's really difficult to get any information from ICE, let alone something um, that personal and, and that detailed. So Akima runs the facility. Um, they, they run the dollar a day work program. It's called the Volunteer Work Program. And it's actually something ICE inherited uh, from, Dave, just wave at me if I'm uh, going on too long here because it's, you know, um, they inherited the volunteer work program from the federal prison system. Um, and it was, it, it was considered, it was introduced actually when the United States uh, formed a different type of concentration camp, um, concentration camps they called internment camps uh, during the, the Second World War under FDR. Um, and uh, Japanese Americans were, were brought into these facilities under suspicion of being enemies of the state uh, by virtue of nothing else aside from their heritage uh, and they wanted people to work so they instituted this program um, and uh, the uh, it's been carried forward to now and we see it uh, at use 
in, in, in ICE facilities, um, like the one that is down in Batavia. But what's particularly interesting about Akima down there is Akima also runs the commissary that Kara touched on. So uh, when you buy a $4 ramen noodle, you're buying uh, a set of ramen noodles that cost four days work and you're paying the company that paid you to do the work. So it, it, it's a really knotted system. You have a, a, a company that's, that's a subsidiary of a, a, a super organization that has a very complicated tax structure um, that, that farms out its duties within the facility to people, pays them $1 a day, and then that money goes back into a chemist's pocket when those individuals purchase ramen noodles or soap from the facility that they are detained within. And we used to have, I mean, that's not new in this country. We, we used to call that a coal town. You know, the mine owned the bar, they owned the grocery store, they owned the rail cars, you worked for them. And then any money that you spent afterwards went back into their pocket. And there's a reason we, we, we don't allow systems to run that way anymore because it doesn't make any sense and it's backwards. And there are people now throughout the United States, attorneys who are arguing that not only it, is it backwards, it, it's a clear violation of, of states' labor laws, um, of, of, of state constitutions. I mean, the, 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 the lawsuit that we wrote about that was at the center of the story that Dave mentioned, the contention is that this is, this is farmed out prison labor. That, that's, that's the kind of stuff that was happening in the post reconstruction era in the South. And uh, I guess we're still confronting the legacy of it, unfortunately, today. Um, I want to touch briefly, though, on some other practices at that facility which are questionable, uh, to say the least. Um, and I think speak to the way uh, that detainees are viewed um, by ICE's bureaucracy. Um, as Kara mentioned just generally, I think it's hard for anyone who hasn't been in a situation like that to imagine the kind of isolation that those people are experiencing. I mean, forget the fact that you're detained, but you're detained in a foreign country where you don't have, uh, you don't have, um, you don't have, likely don't have fluency in the language. 48% uh, of the people at last count were in Batavia, were, had no prior civil or criminal conviction. So these are people with absolutely no experience handling a detention setting. And anyone who is there for, for a criminal charge has served their time in the eyes of the state. So anyone, anyone who, is, who is framed as a criminal within this facility has been convicted in the United States and served a sentence that the court deemed just. And then on their, upon their release, they are again taken and, and brought to Detavia for an indeterminate amount of time. Um, there's no oversight uh, for the security tiers. So as Kara mentioned, there's dormitory-like settings, but there's also settings that are far closer to a prison cell and can find people uh, for much longer periods during the day. And you know, anecdotally, I've spoken to a lot of uh, detainees who say that the assignments, uh, the security assignments are are just about arbitrary and can be used as a discipline measure. Now, the New York State prison system isn't anything to aspire to, but there are, um, there are processes in the New York State prison through which you can challenge security designations like that. And there's other aspects of, of, of their system that make certain aspects of ICE system look democratic, uh, which again uh, is, um, is unfortunate to say the least. Another thing, they, when people are discharged from Batavia, by and large, they don't give them any heads up. They don't give a heads up to their families, to their attorneys, uh, to people like Kara. Uh, they abruptly release people and they drive about a mile from the facility. These are Akima guards from what we understand. Uh, drive about a mile from the facility in an unmarked car and they deposit the detainees at a gas station where a Greyhound bus stops uh, twice early in the morning. Uh, and then doesn't return for the rest of the day. That, uh, that's peculiar 
uh, even before a pandemic started. Uh, and it was peculiar uh, before you talk about seasonal changes and whether someone is detained during the summer and released during the winter might not be dressed properly. Uh, I mentioned the pandemic because there's still, there's still public health orders about how many people can congregate inside. So even though there's a gas station, you can't hang out in there very often because there's a limit on how many people can just linger there. So when we confronted this issue in the spring, we had a situation where detainees were being abruptly dropped off at a gas station, sometimes without money to buy a bus ticket, typically without any understanding of where they might go because they had no opportunity to plan. Uh, and in the absence of people like Kara and people who, um, who volunteer with her organizations and others, wouldn't have any, any, there would be no social safety net for them whatsoever. Um, and we talked to, uh, we talked to a gas station uh, clerk there and uh, he was a veteran, uh, someone you might not expect uh, to be um, an advocate for um, people new to this country who are, uh, who are in ISIS system. And he told us that he sees people, he sees, you know, he sees state prisoners, he sees federal prisoners that are treated better um, than these people. And, uh, and he said he feels like, a, you know, excuse my language, he feels like a piece of shit working there every day and staring out a glass door at people who can't come inside. Um, there's a lot um, more I could go into, but I want to, I want to give some time, I don't want to overtake my time here. And um, I want to give some time uh, to Rob and then obviously to, to any questions. But, you know, thanks again for, uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak. And, um, and I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, so we've, we've now talked about the, the, um, uh, the circumstances for the people who are most negatively affected. Let's talk about who profits from this situation. And, and Rob, if you could speak to that. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just by way of introduction, again, my name is Rob Galbraith. I am a senior researcher at Public Accountability Initiative, uh, which is a, a nonprofit corporate and government watchdog group um, based in Buffalo. Um, <clears throat> we are really focused on um, what we call power research, which is research on networks of wealthy, wealthy and powerful people, organizations, um, and the relationships between them. Um, we, we do all, all kinds of research, both on the, the government and, and, and private side of things. And really what we try to do and facilitate other people to do is to gain a bigger picture um, understanding of how political and economic power works uh, in the United States and around the world, um, what you know, specific structures uh, uh, exist to perpetuate the sort of the, um, I guess the, 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 the dominant ruling order and um, you know, identify leverage points in areas where um, advocates, um, activists, academics can insert themselves into that power structure to um, try to force change. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I got my start um, in, in looking at ICE locally, um, I think probably around um, around the time of that, uh, the, the October 2016 raids, um, which I think were some of the biggest uh, workplace raids um, in Buffalo in, in, in a long time. Um, <clears throat> and since then, I've done a lot of research documenting and trying to sort of figure out the ways that um, ICE um, shows up, I guess, in our local uh, politics and our local uh, economy, because, and I get, and if, if there's one point I would really uh, hope that people can walk away from this with, is that ICE is, you know, a lot bigger an institution and a system than just the, uh, you know, this, this archipelago of detention facilities where, um, you know, Kara and Phil have, have gone into really, you know, really great and, and painful detail uh, about how, how human beings are, are treated. Um, but, 
you know, I, ICE as a, a system, ICE as a, a an, an institution in the United States is a lot bigger than, than these detention facilities. And it's a system that's fully integrated into uh, the national economy and into regional economies, including our local regional economy. Um, it's fully integrated into economy, uh, the political structure, and the actual, you know, geographic space, um, you know, that, that, we, that we inhabit. And, and it includes, um, it includes uh, you know, people and institutions we interact with every day. It includes, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the buildings and actual, like I said, the, the physical spaces that, that we encounter and, and interact with um, every day. So I guess where, where I'm going to go is um, trying to build out our understanding of, of how ICE uh, appears and is manifested locally. Um, because, you know, I, I guess if I was, if I was to go into just give an answer to the, the question posed by the, the, the question posed in the, 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 the name of, of this panel, I, yeah, I think ICE does run concentration camps. Um, but I think their ability to do that is supported by basically the rest of the economy, really um, banal things, because in order for ICE to, um, you know, round up people, arrest people, and confine them in, in, in these prisons, uh, ICE needs other, other things to be able to make that happen. It needs office space. It needs computer systems and, you know, copiers and printers. It needs, uh, you know, airlines, uh, you know, as Phil was talking about it, it, it needs um, businesses to, uh, to subcontract out to actually operate the prisons. They need cars and mechanics and they need guns and they need um, gun ranges to practice uh, where they shoot. Um, so I, ICE, like the, the, the sort of the, 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 the gulag archipelago of, of ICE facilities is, is dependent on, you know, a, a much larger structure that uh, involves, um, you know, many sort of banal kind of businesses, just the, the, the types of things that, you know, any business in, in the United States um, requires. And it, it, it is a business. Um, you know, these private businesses that provide services to ICE uh, depend on these government contracts as a really vital source of revenue. And out from there, many of these, uh, these vendors, these, these businesses, uh, whose, whose operations, whose, you know, day-to-day -day running um, allows ICE to operate in the way that it does day-to-day, -day. these vendors in turn um, are really involved in um, our, 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 our civic sphere. They, they, they fund the politicians uh, of both major parties that set local and national political priorities. They are heavily involved in, in lobbying and in, in seeking you know, subsidies from, from the state, local, and federal governments. Um, and so in, in that way, ICE is really you know, insinuated into um, just a lot of the areas uh, you know, that, that are really vital uh, to our economy or, or, or really at least um, you know, make up a huge part of, of, our, of our economy and you know, through their role in the economy uh, in, in our political sphere. Um, so I'm gonna start with talking about real estate um, because that is in any sort of regional uh, structure of economic and political power, the real estate industry is probably almost always, you know, one of the most important nodes, you know, aside from maybe of probably like finance, banking, and, and the legal industry. Um, so there are, there's four main uh, large uh, real estate businesses in Buffalo that um, make uh, collectively millions of dollars a year through leases to uh, the federal government for ICE and for um, Customs and Border Protection. And I talk about both of those uh, here because even, even though I think, you know, mo we've mostly just been talking about ICE so far, uh, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, because we are located in this, uh, that, that Kara was talking about, this 100 mile uh, border zone, a lot of, um, 
at least it's my understanding and, and, and Kara and Phil, or, or, or you know, I, I guess anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. It's my understanding that a lot of the, the immigration enforcement that happens is uh, Customs and Border Protection is, is also um, a participant. And so I think, you know, it's really important to think about both of these agencies, uh, you know, which together come under the umbrella of the Department of Homeland Security um, that are, you know, really, really present um, in, in enforcing both, um, you know, the, 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 the immigration priorities of currently the Trump administration, before that the Obama administration and whoever, whomever is in power, um, I mean, they, and they do, they do other things as well. I think, um, you know, if, if anyone was involved in the uprisings this summer around uh, police violence that were sort of kicked off by George Floyd's murder, um, locally we had um, lo a lot of the local protests were, were policed by, uh, by federal authorities from, I think, ICE and CBP. I know, um, Department of Homeland Security, I'm, I don't remember which division it was specifically, um, they flew an airplane uh, in a, just flying in a loop over Buffalo, uh, monitoring the protests for every day for at least a week, um, I remember earlier this summer. Um, but anyway, I, I, I kind of got off, got off on, a, on a tangent there. And what I was talking about was, was real estate and the real estate developers that, um, that, that profit off of um, ICE and CBP's, uh, you know, activities locally. And the, the really big one that I'm going to focus primarily on is, is uh, the, the real estate developer uh, Uniland. They're one of the biggest real estate developers um, in the region. Uh, they are really, really active in the civic sphere um, and they are the top, um, beneficiary uh, of, of rents from, from ICE and CBP. Um, Uniland, I think probably most importantly and most iconically is the developer and owner of the big skyscraper at um, 250 Delaware Avenue in downtown Buffalo. And I will actually, I'm gonna try to share my screen just to see if I can share a picture of that. Um, this is a building Anyone that's going to be familiar with anyone that's you know fairly familiar with downtown Buffalo will probably recognize this building. It was built in the past uh, six or seven years, I think. Um, they were a Uniland and Delaware North, uh, the company that's headquartered there, were applying for for subsidies around 2012, 2013 for this, um, and this is where. On the seventh floor, um, ICE's uh, um, field office is located, and that includes field offices for for the two uh, different parts of ICE, um, in, uh, which are the enforcement and removal operations, which is traditionally uh, the the part of ICE that you know goes after. Um, you know, migrants who, who are here, but there's also a division called Homeland Security Investigations, which generally they are supposed to be focused on like the major, major criminality, uh, terrorism, um, um, you know, drug cartels, things like that. Although I will note that um, it was that Homeland Security Investigations was involved with the investigation and the, the workplace raids um, in October 2016 that, that resulted in the detention of the Buffalo 25. Um, another sort of coincidence that I just, and, and you know, if you, I guess if you have my approach to thinking about structures of power, uh, it's coincidence isn't really the right word, but um, a, a sort of a, a, a quirk uh, of, of how um, of how this uh, you know operation of of of, detain, of you know arresting detaining and deporting migrants uh, shows up in Buffalo is that the former U.S. attorney for the Western District of New York William Hochul uh, one of his last big things he did in <laughs> one of the last big things he did in office was leading the the Buffalo 25 raid and and if you if you look up some of the you know the 
if you look up some of the, the reporting around this, uh, you know, you'll see he's the one giving quotes about, um, you know, the necessity of this raid. And this, this raid happened, it's important to note, uh, under the Obama administration, um, again, this, uh, this complex, this system of, um, ar of arresting, detaining, and deporting migrants is bipartisan. Um, it predates the Trump administration. It predates the Obama administration as well. Um, this, was, this happened during the Obama administration just before uh, the 2016 election that uh, resulted in Donald Trump becoming the president. Uh, this was, uh, I think, yeah, like I said earlier, this is one of the largest uh, workplace raids in, in recent memory in, in Buffalo, if not the largest. Um, and yeah, tw you know, resulted in the, the arrest of 25 people led by William Hochul in one of his last acts as the US attorney. He, it should be noted, is married, is married to uh, Kathy Hochul, the Lieutenant Governor of New York State uh, under, the Democratic Lieutenant Governor of New York State under, under Andrew Cuomo. Uh, as soon as William Hochul left his public office as the US, uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of New York, he joined Delaware North as the, the company's uh, top lobbyist and, and general counsel, uh, where he works in, in that same building uh, where ICE's local headquarters is. Um, that, that's, the, that's, the sort of, uh, that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about when I talk about how um, insinuated into you know, nearly every aspect of, of the public sphere and political life that, um, that, that where ICE shows up here. Um, so that building, uh, 250 Delaware Avenue, the, it's called the Delaware North Building. It's, I think every space in that building, I wanna say almost at, at least almost every square foot in that building that is not ICE offices is uh, either corporate offices for Delaware North which is one of the biggest, um, you know, it's, it's probably the largest, uh, if it's the largest or second largest uh, privately owned corporation in Buffalo. Um, the Delaware North, yeah, their corporate offices are there. There is a, a high-end hotel, uh, Weston Hotel there. Um, there's also a, a, a cafe uh, on the first floor owned by Delaware, owned and operated by, by Delaware North. This is, you know, very much is the Delaware North building. And it's sort of, it's an iconic building of, I think Buffalo's, the, it's, it's, a, it's an icon of the, the narrative around Buffalo's uh, economic uh, revitalization as well. Uh, you know, it represented the investment of like, um, you know, $110 million by Uniland, something like $50 million by Delaware North in building it. Uh, they built it on, a, uh, on the footprint of, of where a historic building uh, in Buffalo used to be. It's right, it's, you know, right downtown in the, the Chippewa district, and it is very, very, very big. Um, Rob, can I ask that you take just a minute or two to wrap up your thoughts, and then we'll we'll try oh, and integrate yeah, some of this sorry. additional stuff in the in the uh, question answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, Uniland gets about two million dollars a year in rent from ICE for that that building. There's other developers include uh, Aquest Development, um, which is based in Williamsville. They they bring in about um, $2.4 million a year uh, renting um, Customs and Border Protection offices in Erie, Pennsylvania, and in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Um, Larkin Development, uh, the company owned by uh, Howard, Howard and Leslie Zemsky. Howard Zemsky is the former uh, chair or is the current chairman of Empire State Development, uh, the state um, uh, economic development company. They, they lease space to Customs and Border Protection uh, for the Buffalo Port Office. Uh, and then Simonelli Real Estate um, leases space for the CBP Buffalo Border Patrol Station. I, I want to hit just on like a couple, couple other things. Um, some of the other vendors that I mentioned um, that, you know, ICE's activities are, are, are really dependent on um, include like a lot of sort of, again, like very banal things, the types of things that, you know, any business requires, but are huge profit centers for for these businesses. So the largest like local vendor to, to ICE is called MVP Network Consulting. Uh, they have about 
half a million dollars in contracts for, and they're just an IT contractor, just you know, computers, wires and stuff. The second big, biggest one is the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired um, run by Goodwill of, of Greater Rochester. And they have like $300,000 uh, in contracts where it's it's a charitable organization trying to find uh, you know work for blind and visually impaired people. Uh, they they brought in three hundred. They they have three hundred thousand dollars in contracts to supply things like soap to ICE, um, but you know a lot of other really banal things like waste management, uh, copiers, um, gun ranges, all, all sorts of things. Um, so I guess. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I sort of, I, I went into a little too much detail um, just trying to build the structure of, of what I'm talking about, but, and I can go into a lot more about how a lot of these organizations, especially Uniland, um, you know, show up in, in, in public life via their connections to uh, business groups, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, and, and other things. Great, thank you so much. Um, so let's, um... Let's first give an opportunity to the uh, panelists to ask each other any questions. If there's something that, that came out of the discussion that, that strikes you that you want to direct at each other before we open it up to the audience. I mean, I guess I'd just like to, to tag on to something Rob um, mentioned towards the end about that, that Delaware North building that Rob points out, it's about a quarter mile from my office. Um, when you walk in there, you don't know that ice is in there. It's unlabeled and that might be there there may be i haven't looked into it uh, admittedly but there may be some kind of uh, procedural reason why that exists that doesn't make it right um or uh or proper but it it, it may be the case that there is some kind of explanation for it but i would note that the u.s attorney's building has a crest outside of it you know where the fbi field office is in downtown buffalo you know where the u.s attorney's office is why don't you know where ice is? Just really quickly, just to add on to that, is that if you are a person who's, that's where you go for an ice check-in, if you have an ankle monitor or if you're released and you, um, for whatever reason, if you um, receive a notice that suddenly you have to appear here, and again, like um, you are not fluent in English and you're navigating this, again, there's no signs. You go in, there's nothing on the elevators to say where it is. You would have to go up to the person who's sitting at the lobby who can then open the elevator and go take you to the seventh floor. Um, there, there is nothing that makes this easy for, for people going through this system. Interesting. Okay, um, I, I had mentioned to each of the panelists that I was going to ask the first question, which is, what can we do uh, to engage in meaningful change on behalf of migrants in Western New York? What what can we take for for immediate steps to make a difference? I mean, I can start us off. I, one thing I, I hammer home on almost every issue is um, information uh, documentation. It, I certainly didn't know this as uh, before I started being a reporter, but FOIL and FOIA, uh, the Freedom of Information Laws um, for New York State and for the federal government respectively, are available to any citizen. Um, you know, the work that I do, the work that Rob does, the work that uh, Kara does, at least on uh, the organization does on, on, on like documentation side or information side, any citizen can do it. Any citizen can do it. Um, and oftentimes, at least if I'm speaking from a reporter's perspective, it's, it's, it's oftentimes other people who are looking through, they're turning every page in files who come to you and say, I think you should take a look at this. I saw this, I saw this strange thing. I saw this anomaly, this peculiar thing. You should take a look at it. You should look more into it. Um, and that kind of, that ecosystem that exists between the community and, 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 and reporters is important. Um, and that's one of the ways uh, I've seen those connections happen. And I would encourage anybody to, to look into FOIL and look into FOIA. I'd be happy to help anybody out. I don't know if you gave out our email addresses or anything like that, but I can send you, I can send you templates. Um, I can give you advice. Uh, there's a lot of like clinics and stuff like that and, and, and open government groups who can assist you um, in finding the information you want to find for whatever purpose, whether it's an academic examination, whether you intend to write some kind of um, 
uh, traditional uh, journalistic uh, thing with it, or whether you just are part of an organization like CARES or want to be, and you want to use that information as a part of your activism and advocacy. Kara? Yeah, I will, I will back that up. Information, um, you know, find out about the green light law. Niagara County and Erie County are really terrible places to get a driver's license right now, um, even though it is, it is legal to do so if you are undocumented. So um, learn about it, educate other people. Um, I will put our, in the, in the chat, in the q and I'll put our, um, email address info at jfmfwny. Um, come be a phone line volunteer. You can do it from home. It's anonymous. Um, it's, you can, whatever language you speak, people speak it who are detained. Um, be a pen pal, um, ask questions. Um, right now we're trying to encourage people to do watch parties around the Netflix series. Um, Immigration Nation, um, and just just to have conversations with people um, this this month, like, and do it with your neighbors, do it with your family, and just start having conversations around um, the immigration system and how it affects people locally. Great, thank you, Rob. Yeah, I guess my, I mean, in addition, what what Karen and Phil mentioned which i think are, are you know, really critically important um i th yeah i think it's you know connect the dots um i think it's um you know what we're what we're talking about is um a, a really really big structure and i think that can be like very intimidating but i think it's also important to note that as any you know system like that gets larger and the larger and larger a system like that gets and the more different pieces that it's reliant upon those are all those can all become places of weakness for it and and places where uh creative people can can figure out ways to um you know insert themselves in the process so i think it's like on i think it's you know from my from my perspective as a researcher um one of the best things people can do is develop a, a structural analysis of power to, to, uh you know realize that that power and and political violence is waged um by 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 systems that um by by by, by yeah by, by systems that are uh that have a lot of, of different like critical uh, points uh, where, where, where they're weak, uh, they're, they're reliant uh, um, on, on, you know, components of these systems are, have, have different sort of uh, susceptibility, I think, to, to public relations campaigns. I mean, you're never going to shame ICE into, into um, you know, stopping doing what they're doing. But if you can, um, you know, if, 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 you, if you can, you know, highlight ICE's relationship with, with various um, other, other parts of the system, other, you know, organizations that it's dependent on um, and, and undermine those relationships, um, you, can, you can create or you can work to create, I guess, uh, a, you know, a political economy where, where ICE's actions are untenable and, you um, and and where they're where you know no matter how much money they they try to throw at something you know if collectively as a community as a region in western new york we say your money doesn't spend here um it, it becomes a lot harder for for ice to uh you know enact the kind of violence that it does great great thank you i i elevated tina to to join the panel because she had her first question tina mm -hmm. i'll turn it over to you well, thank you. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and listen to your information that you presented. Um, it's, it's eye opening and it's scary. It's, it's really scary. Um, but it's something we should all know. My question was uh, basically with the detention centers and the needs that that um, really Kara presented earlier about um, what they what they what they have to um, the needs that are not just being met as far as basic necessities for with three dollars for a bar of soap, four dollars for a package of ramen, they, they, it costs 10 cents in, at the corner store. And um, 
and my my question is how do how do we help with that those supplies i saw an uh, email with that um a website where we can attach that um because i'm part of some organizations uh, santa is a women's uh, international women's organization my sorority deltas uh, we always are looking for opportunities to help those underrepresented people or people who are in severe need. Um, also, are there other uh, community-based housing opportunities for, for these people who are in these detention centers besides being housed in the center itself? Um, I could answer some of that at least. Um, so, in in terms of like providing funds for people who are inside um who are paying exorbitant prices for things um uh we pay um 20 commissaries a month that for 25 dollars, and then there's a five dollar surcharge for every single transaction we make i'm allowed to make two transactions every 24 hours and then the system shuts my card down <laughs> Um, and it's better than the one in Texas because because of transfers, you know, we were interact with a lot of different online systems like that. Um, so we do have certain um, we have a Unitarian congregation in Canadagua who uses their um, fun their funds that they collect every month to help us pay commissary and it's it's amazing. So um, if 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 you want to, I can show you how to pay commissary for people um, or how to donate so that it goes specifically to commissary. Um, you can also send money orders, but you need to have the name um, and the A number, which is the, again, very much like um, concentration camps and alien registration number yeah. that people have to have. And then in terms of community-based um, alternatives to housing, there isn't funding, right? The federal government isn't pouring billions of dollars into alternatives to private um, prisons. So the, the alternatives that there are are created by communities. Um, in, Buff in the Western New York area, there's Vive La Casa, that, which is run out of Jericho Road Medical Center. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a shelter for people who are seeking asylum. It's an amazing, it's an amazing place. Um, we have, there was a church locally that converted to their basement, it basically into a place for people to stay while they were going through immigration proceedings. Um, and they're not able to do that at this moment anymore, but um, they are, they do amazing work. Um, there's a couple other small places. We are lucky to have them. And the other thing is, um, before the pandemic, at least, we were working with volunteers who said, well, um, you know, I have an extra room or, you know, a an, an mm -hmm. summer house or something, you can use this. Um, and so for both short-term housing for people coming into, you know, for court or whatever, um, or families visiting people at the detention center, um, we had volunteers provide housing for a couple of nights. And then we also had volunteers who provided places um, from you know, three months to six months. Um, we had someone who for an entire year um, housed someone until they were able to you know, get their work permit and mm -hmm. get on their own. So there are spaces, um, but they're created by, by us. Um, you know, by us, the community. <laughs> okay. And it, it comes through you, correct? Through your organization? Those ones, but also, you know, Vive La Casa, Jericho Road, they're incredible. The Peace House of, of Buffalo is another space. It's a smaller space for asylum seekers. So there's a few and they're all over the country, places like this. So if someone had a, a house or room that they wanted to um, present for that use, they would contact. Um, yeah, contact me, and I can put you in contact with 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 anyone. Um, again, please share my. I, I will. I'll um, share the information yeah. of all of the panelists at the end uh, uh, through an email after the event itself. So, thank you, Tina. Um, Andrea, I had a question as well, or actually a couple of questions that were connected. 
Dave, could I just interject real quick? Yeah, sure. I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to CARES organization, but just to touch on what, what Tina touched on here. Um, I interviewed uh, in a confidential capacity, someone who was a recipient of um, justice for migrant families, like pen pal letters. Uh, they, they helped facilitate that. Um, the individual who I spoke to said the letters just about allowed him to keep his sanity in there. Uh, this is an individual who was, um, he overstayed his visa in the United States uh, because a warrant was issued for his arrest in his native country because he's gay. And uh, unfortunately, ultimately, uh, immigration judge decided that she didn't believe he was gay. Um, he was too smart and he could be um, manipulating the system. Uh, so he's, uh, he's got his, his, his asylum claim was rejected and it's on appeal right now. But the, the individual pen pal that they, they hooked this guy up with, uh, he told me, uh, was a lifesaver for him. So I just, if anyone sees, you know, writing letters or visitations as trite or cliche um, or anything like that, um, that's just why I offer that comment. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Andrea, you had a... And I'm sure contributing to their, um, <clears throat> to their funds so that they can buy things is a huge one as well too, because I know people who've been in prison and just getting, you know, uh, the smallest extra thing at the, the shop can make a huge, huge difference in their day or their weeks. Um, my questions are all kind of a jumble. Uh, you know, I think I, what I see is a growing um, willful ignorance about historical uh, concentration camps, specifically Nazi concentration camps. Um, this growing narrative of people who don't believe in the Holocaust or don't um, acknowledge the true um, uh, immensity of, of violence and cruelty that was involved in the Holocaust, diminishing its, its true, uh, um, <clears throat> I don't know what word I'm looking for, but is it necessary to compare ICE and and the like institutional prisons and and deportation facilities to concentration camps in order to draw attention to the cruelty, or are we doing maybe a disservice in the comparison because it could potentially contribute to um, uh, this growing narrative and also could erase some of the nuances of cruelty in ICE detention as well. Um, Cause they aren't the same <clears throat> um, necessarily. There, there are similarities, but the differences could be just as important as the similarities or do you not believe that to be the case? I mean, I, mean, I think it's important to note. I think, I, think, I think it's a good question and something that, you know, advocates ought to grapple with because, um, you know, for, for, for any movement for justice, uh, part, of, part of what you need to do is to, you know, build it, build a, ma a truly a mass movement. And that, and that involves um, constructing messaging to, such that, you know, other people can, can you know, feel comfortable, um, you know, joining with you. I think it is important to note historically that the Nazis didn't invent the concentration camp, right? Um, you know, their concentration camps date back to, uh, you know, at least the, the, the 19th century with uh, camps set up by, by the United States and the Philippines during the Philippine War, uh, camps set up by uh, the, the British in South Africa um, in, in, in the late 19th century. Um, and so I guess in short, I personally, I don't think that referring to, uh, you know, the the facilities that that ICE uses to detain and you know, I think torture people. I don't I don't think using the the term concentration camp is, you know, diminishes um, the, you know, what what the Nazis did um, in in Germany and Eastern Europe. Um, I think that it's it correctly situ situates what ICE is doing in a broader 
longer, you know, longer than 20th century even historical context. And I think it's really important to bring that out. And I think it's, I think it's equally important to draw the connection between the, the atrocities uh, that, the, that the Nazis committed. I think it's just as important to put those in their historical context as well. And, and to show that, you know, these types of things, um, you know, happen and are allowed to happen and are committed throughout human history. And they, they draw on and, and feed on one another. And, and none of these sort of, uh, you know, ethnically, racially directed, um, you know, atrocities, whether they're, uh, you know, the mass, mass imprisonment and, and, and deportation or, you know, going all the way to what the Nazis did, the, the extermination based on their, their uh, you know, ethnic and racial and, and religious identity. Um, uh, I, lo I lost my train. I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, I, I, I th generally, I, th I think it's. A, I think it's. I, I don't think it's. Um, you know, inappropriate to to use the term, and I think doing so helps to situate it uh, in a, in a longer uh, historical context of you know racially and ethnically directed violence that that can that can you know. That, that can manifest in, in a spectrum from, you know, the sort of mass imprisonment, you know, we have, you know, mass, mass uh, you know, sterilization going all, going all the way up to, you know, the extermination camps that, that the Nazis set up for, you know, industrial scale murder. And that, you know, that didn't happen overnight either. That was, that was a gradual process of, of, you know, of you know escalation and and building public uh, acceptance for mm -hmm. Phil or Karen. I think I think jo uh, Rob did a, a good job answering that question. I also think uh, Andrea's question is a good one, um, and I think it's one you can expand uh, to um, looking at the larger political landscape too. I know in my own personal life, I, I vacillate between am I underreacting or overreacting. Uh, to certain uh, elements of the news cycle or stuff that I don't find is appearing in the news cycle. But I think Rob's final point is, is the most important one and the one I would want to reiterate, which is concentration camps by definition are, are concentrated populations. They don't necessarily have to have a forced labor aspect or a mass ex execution aspect. And they're a recurrent, recurrent phenomenon historically. Um, but at what point, and can you anticipate uh, when these camps go from concentrated populations uh, to serving another function. Um, I don't know the answer to that question historically, and I don't know, uh, I don't know the answer to that question now, uh, but I certainly think vigilance is required from all of us mm -hmm. as a country. Right. Kara, any last thoughts on that? No, just to, um, I, I back up what, what they both said. I mean, um, we, we've thought a lot of, about that question, particularly over the past couple of years, because we've been working with um, Never Again Action, uh, which is a, an organization of Jewish people and their allies who are working to kind of draw analogies between concentration camps and what's happening in immigration detention. Um, and through them, they've actually raised enormous amounts of money to help bond people out of um, Batavia. So um, it's something we have conversations with. I can see the, the problems inherent in any just kind of simple analogy, but, but taking things into context and um, talking about it, I think is really important. Yeah, so, and I'm glad the question was asked because I do think that it took it from a simple analogy, as you said, to something that allows us to go into more depth and I appreciate that. Um, I really wish we had more time, but we are out. Um, thank you so much to all three of our panelists who really did a fantastic job of, yeah. of hitting on some critical issues and, and identifying different ways that we can engage in this. Um, we will end by sending out a notice of, of how you can connect with this um, with each of the panelists should you choose to. And um, the other thing that I will add is that we have a couple of events coming up uh, in conjunction with the Social Justice Speaker Series. Um, Tuesday of next week, uh, the same time, 1.30 to 2.45, we will have uh, Shane Burley, 
uh, uh, to talk about um, fascism in the current crisis of 2020. Um, I would invite our panelists and everyone who is participating to join us for that. I'll send out that information and uh, would welcome you. And then we also have on Tuesday evening, as part of the presidential speaker series, uh, Dennis McDonough, who is the former chief of staff for Obama and was a deputy national security advisor. Um, I, I fully intend to ask the question of, of uh, you know, sort of the Obama reflection as an administration in, in complicity with these kinds of policies. Um, as, as was brought up, I think, by Rob earlier in the panel, this is not a new phenomenon. It, it is certainly escalated under the Trump administration and in ways that I find very, very disturbing that we didn't get to tackle. In, in particular, um, the most recent uh, reporting that there are plans to um, to do targeted strikes in key cities as a, as a political tool. Um, but, but I think the point still stands as really important um, that this is not a new phenomenon, that this is something that is bipartisan in nature and that we should all be reflecting on what that means and how we can, how we can work to fight that. So thank you for raising some really important uh, ideas and questions and issues for us all to think about. Um, thank you to all of the attendees uh, and, and we look forward to keeping these kinds of discussions going in future. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Kevin, Rob, Kara, thank you. Tina, you're the last one here, so thank you too. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye. And I wish that I had seen the, the anonymous yeah. attendees question uh, before we close, because I think it is a, 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 a very interesting question. Thank you for pausing the, the recording. Yes. <laughs> and, I'm not sure and, who that came from, but I think it was an excellent question. And if yes. I had seen it, we, we certainly could have integrated it in, uh, but we ran out of time, unfortunately. And the YouTube live stream is now at an end. Thanks for everyone who viewed. Does it stop YouTube. automatically? Uh, if you stop it. <laughs> uh, let's see.